In today's video, we have a lot to discuss, including the future of Patrick Laine and Trevor Zegers. To both these top young NHL stars have a change of scenery coming up, possibly this offseason. Could they both benefit from it? Does it make sense for teams to seek trades for those young players? What kind of returns could they get? We'll discuss both of those scenarios. We've also got some updates, including the possibility the Minnesota Wild goalie Marc-Andre Fleury may not retire. After all, he might be in store for another season. We may also have a suspension coming for wild forward ryan hartman all that plus we have the first canadian team clinch for the playoffs all that and more coming up next So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a lot to talk about here today, uh, including with our playoff spots. We have the first Canadian team. The Vancouver Canucks are officially clinched now into the playoffs. They picked up a 3-2 win today, uh, again, over the Anaheim Ducks, gets them to 100 points. Uh, certainly the Canucks have uh, you know, not had the most consistent team over the last you know, seven, eight years. I think that's the second time they've made the playoffs in eight years. So I'm sure Canucks fans are thrilled uh, with the bounce back season this year and a big step forward that they've taken to get themselves not only in the playoffs but to have a higher ranking spot of course it's not over yet they still have work to do uh, it's difficult to say if they're going to hold down that top spot in their division or if they'll fall a, a little bit i mean it's a tight race between the canucks the oilers uh the golden knights i mean it's hard to say there's enough games left that things could change uh, of course uh, for canadian teams when it comes to the canucks leading the way uh fully expected pretty much a guarantee at this point just a matter of making it official for the edmonton oilers winnipeg jets and Toronto Maple Leafs to clinch as well uh, so it looks like Canada will have four teams representing the country this year of course the Habs the Sens and the Flames uh, not have playoffs in the cards this year uh, when it comes to Winnipeg they've been on a bit of a losing streak they've now lost six straight games uh, they were right at the top of the central division with Dallas and Colorado uh, now they've slipped down uh, solid in the third place I really don't think the Jets can get caught back up because there's not enough runway left uh, Toronto looks likely heading for that number three spot in the Atlantic but uh, it is possible that the Lightning could catch them the Leafs could possibly drop to be a wildcard team uh, the Lightning at this point do play the Leafs two more times uh, they, if they were win, able to win those games and make out four points on Toronto, that could close the gap and get them ahead of them, depending on how the rest of the games go uh, through the rest of the schedule here. So certainly uh, not a given that all these teams are going to be in the spots they're in now, but certainly I'll expect it uh, to clinch. But Canada's uh, first clinched team is now in the mix for sure. But speaking of uh, you know teams that are in the mix here, the Minnesota Wild wish they were in the mix, and they certainly were hoping to be in the playoff hunt. They've fallen out of it, but Ryan Hartman looking at his third suspension in the past year or so, uh, of course, Ryan Hartman and the Minnesota Wild are not completely out of it just yet. Things aren't looking good, though. Uh, of course, we saw yesterday the Minnesota Wild had their goalie pulled for the second time this year in overtime. And this time it backfired on them, and they um, they got scored on by the Vegas Golden Knights and Jonathan Marsh or so. So they, even though they made it to overtime, they don't get any points. Uh, so, it, you know, instead of getting one, they get zero. At this point, though, they pretty much need to or even if they got to, to be honest, it's still a long shot at best that they get in. But there was an incident at the end of the game, which is likely going to cause Hartman to uh, miss some time. Uh, he does have a hearing, which is going to take place tomorrow for unsportsmanlike conduct. Apparently, he threw his stick towards the officials after the overtime loss. I didn't see it happen live, so I didn't... Um, didn't catch it as it happened, but certainly doesn't look good. I mean, Hartman does have a bit of a history there, so I would imagine he's likely going to get a couple of games for this one. It is a phone hearing, so it's going to be less than five. We do know that much, but um, yeah, another piece of bad news. Of course, the Wild already lost Marcus Foligno for the rest of the year as well. So certainly, uh, you know, the players on the Wild team keep dropping there. Not going to make their, their case any better, but like I said, it's pretty much over for them anyways, even though mathematically it might not be. Uh, some notes out of the Los Angeles Kings organization. Uh, Philip Deneau was listed as day-to-day -day with an upper body injury. Uh, he was, uh, I believe, absent from last night's game. Uh, they've moved youngster Alex Turcott to long term injury reserve and they've recalled Akil Thomas. Akil Thomas has put in lots of time developing in the American Hockey League and certainly seems like a, he's ready for more of an opportunity so nice to see him get called up and get another chance there. Another big call up as well as a Seattle Kraken have recalled uh, top prospect Shane Wright who of course you know was uh, a little bit lower in the draft but fell down to the Kraken even though he was expected to possibly be you know right up near number one or number two overall 
falls under the Kraken uh, in the draft two years ago. Of course, he missed a lot of time because of COVID where he was playing in the OHL when they were shut down. He's not one of the players that went overseas um, and had opportunities. So um, clearly uh, he's behind the eight ball in his development, but I think he's made up a lot of ground this year. He's put up a really nice season in the American Hockey League, hitting 20 goals, 43 points in 56 games. Uh, it'd be nice to see him get a look Um to hopefully finish out a chunk of the regular season here in Seattle. I mean, obviously the Kraken are not going to be a playoff team for the second straight year. Um, so he has an opportunity to play some games in the NHL to uh, to show where things are at with them. But at the same time, uh, you know, head back to the American Hockey League to be available for their playoffs. So we'll see. It's certainly nice to see Shane Wright get called up. Not a huge surprise. Hopefully he can make the best of it. And hopefully he's taken some big steps in order to, uh, to you know, really move his development forward here now as i mentioned as well uh, staying with back to minnesota uh, there is word that minnesota wild goaltender mark andre fleury who many were expecting to be his final season his final campaign that it might not be after all uh, mark andre fleury did conduct an interview with the athletic and based on what he had to say it's not a given that he comes back but it's fair to say at this point it's certainly no longer a given that he actually retires and calls it a career. Even though a large part of this season kind of felt like a farewell tour for Fleury, at this point, it sounds like he's having, I don't know, maybe he's just having a tough time making a decision. Maybe he's having second thoughts. He's still having fun, still playing decent level. You know, he's one of those guys that loves the game, and if he feels like he can still play and he's still having fun, I'm sure he's going to want to continue to do so. Uh, obviously, the Minnesota Wild with their goaltending situation, I don't know how GM Bill Guerin's going to feel about everything, but certainly Philip Gustafson, um, fair to say, you know, he's obviously a lot younger, um, but he didn't have as good a season as he did last year. We can say that for certain. And the Wild also have a youngster in Jesper Wallstead, a former first-round pick from a few years back, who's uh, making his second uh, pro season in the American Hockey League with the Iowa Wild and progressing and developing nicely by the looks of things. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen him play a lot, but based on looking at his stats and what I have seen for clips, it does look like he's getting better. He, he did get called up earlier this year and didn't get a game. It didn't go very well. Um, so it's hard to say. I mean, if they bring Flurry back, do they continue to, you know, give Walstead even more time uh, in the minors? I mean, he wouldn't be um, over his ex- uh, waivers exempt period yet. So that wouldn't be an issue that way. You know, what's the deal with Gustafson? Are they comfortable rolling with Flurry and Gustafson next year? What's Minnesota's, you know, kind of strategy going to be next year? Are they going to attempt to be a playoff team? Are they going to attempt to retool? Obviously, this group did not get it done this year. Um, so it's hard to say. You know, Fleury's certainly not necessarily part of the problem, but it's not like he's been, you know, at the same time not playing like a superstar either. So, I mean, he's still giving you better than the average goaltending most of the time. Uh, and like I said, he's such a character, a good teammate, good around the room. Uh, it will be tough to say when he when he finally does call it quits. Uh, it be a big loss for the NHL community for sure, no doubt, especially the team he's with. But he made it sound like if he does want to play next year, that is pretty much Minnesota or bust. I don't think he really is interested in kind of moving his family around yet again. At some point, they'll probably settle back to, you know, somewhere to make it a long-term home, whether it be back in the province of Quebec where he's from, or maybe I'm not sure where else they, they plan to live on a longer-term basis. But he's got a young family still, uh, and they have to factor that in, school and all that. So they're obviously content right now being in Minnesota. And if he wants to be able to continue playing and they're willing to have him, then don't be shocked if Fleury maybe, maybe signs a cheap cheaper one-year deal to return next year. Uh, We'll have to wait and see, but even though we kind of thought it was a given, not so much anymore that there's a chance he's back. Uh, Now, as I mentioned, the two young players I want to focus on today, Patrick Laine and Trevor Zegers. Let's start with Laine. Uh, We got an update today from John Davidson, who's the interim general manager and president of the Blue Jackets. Uh, JD confirmed that Laine will definitely not be back with the Blue Jackets this season, that his season is unfortunately over. Now, of course, on December the 14th, he left the team due to injury with a broken clavicle. And then we found out at the end of January that he was entering the player assistance program. He's only got in 18 games this year. It's not a lot of hockey. Uh, Obviously, he missed time before that as well. So, I mean, that's that's a big blow to having a very, you could call it a lost season, if you will. 
Now, uh, at the same time, it's not shocking news that Line A won't be back this year, uh, except after everything he's been through and through the program. Does it make sense to rush back for a few games? Not necessarily. Some players, if they're able to, uh, they wouldn't you know, like to get back just to get a game or two in, just to confirm that they're feeling good out there and they're healthy, but not every situation, unfortunately, is going to allow that. Now, of course, like I said, I, you have to wonder about the future of Patrick Line. This Columbus team... Of course, has bottomed out. They're not doing well. Um, clearly, this team, I think, needs a different direction. They fired their general manager. They're going to have a new GM coming in who's not necessarily going to have, you know, a long-term allegiance to any of these guys. They won't have, uh, you know, uh, any issues moving players if they feel that makes the team better. Uh, you have to wonder about the future of Lana. I mentioned before about Johnny Goodrow as well. Like, he signed there as a free agent. They'd have to talk to Goodrow because he has a full no-move clause. But... Does it make sense for these guys to be there? In Goodrow's case, you could say probably not for sure. Um, but again, that's a tougher choice because they have to work with the player more. But in Line's case, you know, you have to think after everything he's been through, does it make sense for him to stay? Or could he really benefit from a fresh start? I mean, he's had a good start to his career with Winnipeg, but then obviously there was issues there which led to the trade. You know, now he comes to Columbus, and now look at the state of this team. It hasn't gone well. You know, he still has two more years on his contract at $8.7 million. So it's certainly not going to be easy um, to move the contract. Columbus would have to eat a decent amount of money. You know, a lot of teams would have a lot of confidence and would love to have Patrick Line if he could play anywhere near like he did his first few years with the Jets. But is that version of Line still in there? Can they bring it out? Is he healthy? Where are things at, you know, after going through the player's assistance program? Lots of questions, more than answers with this player. But you think of Columbus, you know, I don't know the issues of what's led to him to go through the player's assistance program either, right? They really haven't heard or, you know, obviously the privacy, we don't know a lot there. But a lot of times when players do go through that, afterwards, sometimes, a lot of times it ends up being for the best to get a fresh start. We've seen it happen on a lot of other occasions. And it's worked out well, like Austin Watson did that with the Predators ended up in Ottawa after had a good run there. Now he's in Tampa. Uh, you know, we've seen it in other cases as well. Um, so, you know, maybe it's best that line a go to a new team, but who's going to want to take on an $8.7 million contract with limited games, limited production this year, even though there's a good history, it's been a while since we've seen that version of him to be confident that it's not going to be a, you know, a bust on their cap. Uh, you know, Columbus might have to eat significant money on those final two years, but really looking at the roster where things are at, I don't know if they would necessarily be open to doing that. So I do wonder what the future of Patrick Laine, uh and, you know, I hope for his sake that uh, the program is working for him. I hope for his sake he can be, you know, healthy, have a good off season and really get himself back where he's ready to roll next year and hopefully get the best version of Patrick Laine that we haven't seen in a while. And I do wonder if, uh, you know, another team besides Columbus might be best for him. There's lots of teams out there, especially teams that are either rebuilding or, or maybe uh, looking for like a st- taking a step in the rebuild. You know, we we know teams like Montreal want to acquire similar age players. That cap hit might scare off Ken Hughes, though. But like I said, if it's the right deal to eat money is available, then maybe, you know, looking at teams like maybe the Ducks or maybe uh, the Sharks or, you know, other teams out there, even a team like Buffalo, we know they need to retool a little bit as well after, again, not meeting expectations. Just throwing teams out there. There's no link to those teams, but – you know, something's got to give. I think Line A's in a new uniform next year. And there's a good chance same goes for Trevor Zegers. We've talked a lot about the connection of Zegers to the Montreal Canadiens, and that very well could be the case. But either way, if it's not Montreal, I know I've seen on today's broadcast of the Canucks and Ducks on Easter Sunday here, uh, the TNT panel talking about the future of Zegers in Anaheim and whether or not that future was bright and there, or should he, you know, will he be gone and gone elsewhere in the not too distant future? They, they talked about the fact that the, um, the Ducks long term here have a little bit of a, you could call it an, almost an embarrassment of riches with young talent down the middle with Cutter Goche on the way, tearing up U.S. college hockey. They have Mason McTavish, obviously, who's developed quite nicely. Leo Carlson's coming along well, you know, then you get Zegras, you know, and they all kind of agreed that you want to take your time and be patient. You don't want to give up on a young player too early. He's only 23. Um, but at the same time, they all kind of agreed that for him to fit there longer term and to be an impact player, he's probably going to have to make some adjustments to his game. And the way that these other players all kind of play, especially Goche and McTavish, 
Um, to fit there, you might need more than just the high-end skill that you see in the, the trick shots and the fancy plays. Those are all kind of cool to watch, and it's great that he can do those things. But I think he needs to round out his game, maybe play a little bit better defensively, um, and at the same time, just you know, round out his game. And that's going to be challenging. Now, he's always played that kind of same style. I do wonder if Pat Verbeek might not be in love with how he plays. Their contract negotiation last summer was very contentious. It took a long time to come to terms. I think it was a major distraction for Zegers. He was late getting into the team, late getting into his season. He's missed a bunch of time with injuries. It's really, again, like Line A, it's almost like a lost season for Zegers where things just have not worked out. Does not mean for sure he's going to be moved by Anaheim, but I don't have any doubt that the former first round would generate a lot of interest around there he's not signed on a long-term deal so you know for a team to make an acquisition it wouldn't be you know as huge of a long-term commitment that way would cost a lot i'm sure when it comes to assets but at the same time you know i don't think there's again any shortage of interest out there uh Zegers is a very interesting player uh like i said he would maybe fit better in other teams but regardless of where he goes i think we need to see his game evolve a little bit to take it to the next level which is probably what you know, the Ducks and Pat Verbeek are going to tell him or any other club that makes an acquisition. But there's been a link to Montreal, obviously because of, I think, uh, his relationship and former uh, teammate in Cole Caulfield when they played together in the U.S. program. Uh, that could be something that we do see. Or there's lots of other teams, I think, that are in a similar state as Montreal looking for that, you know, that young player that might need a change of scenery that they can take advantage of to come in and really elevate their program as well. So could we see guys like Lane and Zegris in new uniforms next year? It certainly seems quite plausible. Let me know your think your thoughts on your most likely landing spots and what some mock trades might look like to acquire these top young talents for different teams around the league. Let me know your thoughts. We'll talk further. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.